Welcome to Headlines. This is Arye Leibowitz. I will be filling in for David this week as he takes a much needed and I believe very well-deserved break from the show. We have a very interesting program this week. We'll be talking about what is known as Rabbi's Son Syndrome, which is the term that people use to refer to the tendency of children of Rabbanim to struggle with their father's public persona. Sometimes it makes the child uncomfortable that everybody knows who his father is, and he feels, whether accurately or not, that everybody's looking at him, sort of a fishbowl mentality, and analyzing his behavior. Sometimes he might feel that the expectations are greater of him than they are the rest of his community, or certainly the rest of his friends. He may also feel neglected because his father is acting as a father to the rest of the community, and sometimes at the expense of being a father to his children. On the flip side, when a child sees that his father is so relied upon by people and spends his life helping and comforting people, he may be inspired and want to become more like his father. And this is not obviously limited to the children of Rabbanim, but of really any public figure or anyone who's extremely busy. And uh, we're going to talk to three very interesting and special guests each coming from a different perspective on this issue. We will talk to Rav Shai Shechter, the son of the great Gon and Rosh Yeshiva, Rosh Kolo and Yeshivas Rav Enitzak Elchanan, Mori Virabi, Rav Herschel Shechter, Shlita, but also a significant Talmud Chacham and Marbitz Torah in his own right. Rav Shai will describe what it feels like to grow up as the child of such a major Torah personality, someone who is constantly in the public eye, who had to take very public positions on things. We will also talk to the world-famous psychologist who is so heavily re- relied upon by every segment of the Orthodox community, Dr. David Pelkovitz. Dr. Pelkovitz will explain to us the psychological aspects and advise those of us in public jobs how to make sure we're giving our children the support that they need and make sure that they don't feel neglected. And finally, we'll talk to a great Chabad Talmud Chacham, Rav Baruch Oberlander, the Chabad chief rabbi of Hungary and editor of Or Yisrael Torah Journal. We'll ask him to address the issue of giving up a normal Orthodox community and upbringing of his children in order to spread Yiddishkeit and Hasidus, which is something that the Rebbe expected of all the Shluchim, and the Shluchim have done that. And we'll try to ask him both from a practical and a halachic perspective how to best balance a life's, a life's mission versus concern for one's own children. But before we get to our show, I want to mention a new sefer that our Achsanya Shel Torah, Rav David Lichtenstein, has just published after more than a decade of very hard work with an entire team of great Talmidei Chachamim. It is a two-volume sefer on Mishnah Baruch Chela Gimel, on the, Chel, on the Hilcho Shabbos section of Mishnah Baruch. It's called Mishnah Achrona, published by Oz Vahadar. The Sefer essentially gathers more than a century of halachic discussions ever since the completion of the Mishnah Bura, and with incredible hekif and clarity, it discusses every possible issue on each Sif Katan of Mishnah Bura. It's, it, it also works very hard to show the seeming contradictions in the Mishnah Bura. Sometimes you won't even realize that what the Mishnah Bura is saying here seems to go against what the Mishnah Bura says somewhere else. And, and it shows how the Gedolim have reconciled those contradictions. In the introduction, they write, Rav David writes, that uh, they asked of Chaim Kenievsky if one can assume that contradictions in the Mishnah Bura can be accounted for by simply saying that the Mishnah Bura had, the Chavot Chaim had a help writing the Mishnah Bura. He didn't do it all by himself. His son wrote parts of it. His son-in-law wrote parts of it. So maybe that, uh, that's why there are contradictions. And Chaim Kenievsky said, absolutely not. That is not an acceptable way to be miyashiv the stiras in the Mishnah Bura because the the Chavetz Chaim certainly read all of it. He oversaw the project, and he certainly allowed everything to be printed. So there has to be a way to be miyashev when there are stiras, and the, the, the Sefer works hard on that as well. But primarily what it does is it really gathers uh, over 100 years' 
worth of halachic literature and comes up with every possible modern day issue that you could think of or that you couldn't think of and discusses them with, uh, with tremendous, tremendous marmakomos. This sefer is going to be an instant classic. In fact, Rav David told me that he published 12,000 copies of the sefer, keeping 11,000 in Eretz Yisrael and shipping 1,000 to America. Well, all 11,000 have already sold out in Eretz Yisrael. I received my copy today and haven't been able to put it down. The availability in America is going to be on a first-come, first-served basis. I, th- I think the best way to describe the Sefer is that what the Masifta has done for Shas, the Mishnah Achrona does for Mishnah Brura. A really amazing work, never could have been written by a single person, but somehow David found the time and energy to lead this team of writers and editors and Tamidich Chachamim and really uh, create uh, a phenomenal Sefer, an instant, an instant classic. Now for our riddles of the week. First, the Ran Mesach Nedarim and Davzayim Beis asks the Kasha. The Gemara there proves that an Ani is Chash of Kameis, that a poor person is considered like he's dead because the Pasuk says in Shemos, Kimeisu Kol Anashim Amavakshim Esnavshecha, and yet we know that Dasan and Aviram had not died. So the Gemara concludes, what does it mean that they were Mesim if they haven't died? It must be that they became poor, and that's why they were considered to be Kameis. So the Ran over there asks the Kasha. He says, a person who's poor is not the only one who's chash of kames. There's a whole list of people that are chash of kames. And included on the list of those who are chash of kames is Mishael Lobanim. Someone who doesn't have any children is also chash of kames. So how does the Gemara know that Dustin and Avir were considered dead on account of their poverty and not, a, not on account of their childlessness? The question is that the Pasuk says explicitly in Bamidbar, so that's the Ran's question, that's not our question. Our question is, the Pasuk says explicitly in Bamidbar, Parak Zayin, Pasuk of Zayin, that v'dosan v'aviram yotsu nitzavim pesach ha'aleim v'nashayim u'b'neim v'tapam. The Pasuk explicitly refers to the children of Dasan the Aviram. At the time that the uh, Pasuk says, Ki mesu nafshecha, Dasan and Aviram's children were still alive. They had children. So how could the Ran ask that maybe the Pasuk means that they didn't have children? What, uh, th- that can't be what the Pasuk means. We know that they had children. It's true that children ultimately died, but not at that point in the Chumash when and uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was told, Ki then their children were still alive. Uh, a second riddle. The Gemara in Sanhedrin derives from the Pasuk, that you'll give truma to Aaron, that Tchiyas HaMesim is Minatora. You see Minatora that there's a concept of Tchiyas HaMesim. Because Aaron never made it in Tarot Yisrael to receive Truma. So if the Pasuk is saying in the future you're going to give Truma to Aaron, it must mean that, uh, that uh, there's going to be a time where Aaron's going to be in Tarot Yisrael receiving Truma. Oh, you see Tchiyas HaMesim. So the Aruch Liner in Nida of Samachal from Beis asks in the name of the Sidre Tara that the Gemara says in Nida actually over there in that sugya mitzvos betelos la asadavo that ultimately la asadavo there aren't going to be mitzvos anymore. So if that's the case, even after Tchias Amesim, there won't be any truma given to Aaron. So how can the meaning of this Pasuk be understood as the truma that Aaron will get one day, if Mitzvah's Patelos Las Lavo, then Aaron's not going to receive truma one day because we're not going to have a mitzvah to give truma to Aaron uh, one day. So those are the two questions. And if, as always, you can call in or write in your answers. And Rav David in next week's program will announce uh, the best answers the winners of the uh, of the riddle. Now for Dvar Torah and Parshas Korach. I'm, I'm recording this on a Friday morning of Parshas, Erev Shabbos Parshas Shalach, but uh, it's figured it makes more sense, at least Parshas Shalach and Chutz it makes more sense to say Dvar Torah on Parshas Korach, because by the time anyone listens to this, it will at least be, will at least be holding by Parshas Korach. The Pasuk, in recounting the episode of Korach and Parshas Pinchas, you know, later in Chumash, we review what happened with Korach. The Pasuk explicitly says that Ubnei Korach lo mesu. The, the children of Korach didn't die. 
And the Ebenezer comments that this is very significant because the children of Dasan and Aviram, who helped out in this rebellion, they did die. And the reason for this, says the Ebenezer, is that Ra'as Dasan va Aviram kasha mi Ra'as Korach. The evil of Dasan va Aviram was greater. What they did was worse than what Korach did. And that's why when we recount the story in Dvarim Parikir Aleph, the Pasuk says that the Onesh was Vasher Asa Ledasan Va'aviram, specifically. The Torah refers to what happened to Dasan Va'aviram, nothing about Korach. In fact, in Tehillim, when the Pasuk recounts all of the downfalls of the Jewish people in the Midbar, all of the things that we did wrong in the Midbar, and there were many, it says, Tiftach aretz vativla dasan vatchas aladas aviram vativareish baadasam lahavet vayit rishaim. Amazing that in recounting the entire story, David Amel doesn't think to mention Korach. Korach is what the whole thing was about. He doesn't mention Korach. Why are dasan vaviram worse than Korach? And if they are worse. Why does Korach normally get all the credit? Why is this called the rebellion of Korach if in fact Das and Vaviram were really worse than Korach? Another question, when Moshe first tries to deal with the rebellion, he calls for Das and Vaviram to meet with him. And amazingly, not to Korach, who is really his relative and presumably he could have reasoned with based on a previous relationship. What was his intention in reaching out specifically to Das and Vaviram? And a third question. Vayikach Korach is what they call a uh, dangling modifier. It never tells us what Korach took. Rashi explains, of course, that the phrase means, He took himself to one side to have a taina on the kuhuna. He separated himself from the rest of the Eida to strengthen the machlokas. He, he separated himself from the community because he, was, he wanted to create machlokas. Now that certainly justifies how Vayikach could make sense. But it still doesn't really explain, of all the words to choose, why choose the word Vayikach? Of all potential words to express the same exact sentiment, why would Vayikach be chosen? There are better words to describe how a person separates himself. Vayiparid would be separated, he separated. Why not say something like that? So I think there's a, the, the dual message of the Machlokas between Korach and Moshe is really a message of, of proper Jewish leadership and of how to react when someone starts a Machlokas and attacks you. First of all, Korach is described as a Yikach because his entire purpose, his entire attitude is that of self-interest, of advancing his own agenda. It doesn't say Vayikhu, even though Korach had plenty of support. So it could have said that they took, they separated themselves, because Korach wasn't interested in everybody else. He was only interested, his whole agenda was about Korach. And that's why Moshe's response is, Lo mehem nasasi. I never took anything from anybody, no self-interest. You know, Harry Truman once said, you'd be amazed at how much you, you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit for it. And that's part of the idea behind going to Das Torah. People who go get Eitzah from great Tamidich Chacham and Gedolei Torah before they make life's decisions. What's the idea? Why are they going? Does the, does the person know more about business than they do? Does the person know? They go to somebody who's just completely selfless, who doesn't think about what do I have to gain from this, from this decision. And, and such a person is in a great position to advise. The great Talmud Chacham doesn't know more about business than you do, but if he is truly a great Talmud Chacham, if he is truly a Gadol Yisrael, he'll give an unbiased opinion without thinking about how he can benefit from your choices. And how many people do we really have in our lives that we can truly say that about, that are totally unbiased? We welcome to the program now Rabbi Shai Shechter. Now, Rabbi Shai Shechter is the Rosh based Medrash of the Young Israel of Woodmere and is a very prominent Marbit Torah, someone who uh, speaks all over the place and uh, speaks to all different kinds of Jews who appreciate his, uh, his derech in Limud HaTorah and in Harbat HaTorah. And uh, we're specifically interviewing Rabbi Shechter today for this program because Rabbi Shechter is also the son of Hagon Harav Herschel Shechter Shlita. And uh, I thought he would provide an interesting perspective on what it's like to 
fun lights, what it's like to grow up as the child of a public figure, and particularly of a, of a Gadol B. Yisrael. And in a certain sense, this discussion is going to be about what it's like to grow up in the limelight in general, but the Shechter's experience is very unique, because his father's not just a rabbi, he's a Torah giant, he's been a Rosh Hashiva for over 50 years. Um, and uh, but but I think Rabbi Shechter, first of all, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for agreeing to uh, to speak with me today. But Thank you. I, I think a pleasure. Um, I think, in a certain sense, your experience will resonate um, with with the listeners a lot more because I know each time you've spoken at my shul, people have come over to me and they've always loved what you had to say and they loved the Torah. But they always say, like, the, the part I love the most is when he talks about his father, when he talks about the things that he's learned from his father and the stories about his father. So uh, I think that, that uh, even though not everyone shares your experience, people are, are still inspired by it. So um, thank you for, again, thank you again for agreeing to, uh, to, to have this conversation. I think it will be a big, a big toella. Okay, it's my pleasure. I'm so happy to be on. Okay, great. So let's let's get started. I guess I guess the the best way to start is to just ask when did you realize your father wasn't like everybody else? When did you realize that your upbringing was maybe different than all your friends' upbringings and that your father wasn't just a regular guy? See, that's a very interesting question. I have fond memories of my grandfather, Rab Melech Shechter Zechrona Levracha who also was a prominent Rav on his own right, but as children, he always, always used to tell us that you kids really don't understand who your father is. And he used to say to us all the time, your father is a walking Sefer Torah. Take advantage of him. He's a walking Sefer Torah. And as a child, I re- never really understood what exactly he meant because my father, when we were growing up in school, Anytime there was something that we came home with from school, anytime a Rebbe told us anything, it could be the second grade Rebbe or the fifth grade Rebbe, my father always made it as if the Rebbe knew best and the Rebbe knew everything. And even when I grew older and it was clear that the Rebbeim were not always right, my father always told us that the Rebbe's right and he made himself to be almost like the same kind of personality. My father always used to tell us that I'm a mechanech and he's a mechanech and he didn't differentiate at all between himself and, uh, and our rabbeim, even in grade school. And that's partially because he has such a unassuming and humble demeanor. That's just the way he is, which is really uh, amazing. And it wasn't until I got older that I realized how unique my father actually was and how he was really in a league of his own that was so much different and so much deeper than so many other people that I had encountered up until that point. I do remember that I had a friend who came over for Shabbos, and Shabbos morning my father came to wake us up for Minyan, and after Shabbos my friend's parents called me on the phone and they said, you won't believe it. Our son called us after Shabbos and he said that Rav Shechter came to wake them up in the morning for davening, and I said, who else do you think was supposed to wake us up for davening? That's what fathers do. And uh, it was interesting to me to realize that, to me, he was really my father, but to the outside world, he was Rav Shechter, and it was surprising to them that my father would come into the room in the morning and actually, you know, say something or knock on the door and wake people up. That was something that was a very eye-opening experience for me. As I got older, I started to realize how unique and special he actually is, and how much of an opportunity we as children had every single day growing up in his house and watching the way he acted and being privileged to be a part of his life, uh, it only came later that we were really able to appreciate what that really meant. When you would, when you would learn with him as a child, would it, would, would it just seem different? I mean, I, I can't imagine having a chavrus with Rosh as a five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old. How, how did that go? So I assume we're allowed to be very honest on the show. I assume that's what you're looking for. <laughs> um, as a child, it's actually extremely challenging to learn with someone like Rav Schechter. Um, My father, you know, used to sit and learn with us, and we as children were not really understanding why he was light years ahead of us and why every single question we had he knew the answer to right away and um, why it is that my father has no problem sitting for hours on end and learning and, 
you know, there's nothing that bothered him about the fact that we missed a lunchtime or a dinner time. I remember after I got married, um, and a little bit before, I had a, a great schuss to learn the Chavrusa with my father for nine years in yeshiva. And we used to learn every day second Seder, and a few days a week we would learn night Seder as well. And there were a number of times, I speak to my wife about it all the time, how we were just newlyweds, and Seder officially ended at 6.30. And my father, if he didn't have a shear that night, he just carried on because we were in the middle of a sugya. And it was 7 o'clock and 7.30 and 8 o'clock and 8.30 and 9 o'clock, and he literally had not looked up from his Gemara. He's a tremendous masmid. And my wife was waiting outside. At the time, my cell phone was always off when I learned with my father because he's so focused. And if you lose focus while learning with him, even for a short period of time, you know, you really uh, get lost. So my phone was always off, and I, you know, it could be two, three hours that we would go way over time. And uh, as a child, it's very frustrating. But as you get older, you realize what a tremendous masmid this this really is. I, I remember from those years in yeshiva as well that my father often would be called out to uh, a meeting or to something, and it could last an hour or two or sometimes an entire afternoon. Sometimes he would be busy one afternoon and come back two or three afternoons later, and he would literally pick up right in the middle of where we left off. And he was surprised why... I wasn't holding there. He was surprised why, you know, we were in the middle of trying to work through a difficult toast and we just took a two, three day break because he had meetings, but why don't you pick up in the middle of a sentence? Like, where have you been the last few days? And it's frustrating, it's difficult, but at the same time, it's so incredible to watch it and to see a person who's so shakua and learning, but at the same time, a individual who's so involved in Sarchit Sibur that sometimes they have to take their mind or their or their speech away from the Gemara itself, but when the distractions and the responsibilities are out of the way, they are literally right back where they started. Uh, speaking about your father as a as a public figure and someone who had to deal with still does deal extensively with Sarkar Tibor, did it ever um, frustrate you or bother you to see your father's name in the newspaper or hear him spoken about? You know, specifically uh, in the world at large, you know, there there are lots of different kinds of people, and not everyone has the same reverence for uh, great Talmidei Chachamim, and sometimes things get very political, and I'm sure uh, things weren't always favorable. How, how, does, how does a child react to something like that? It's a great question. Uh, for us as children, it was always very painful. And uh, we learned a number of great lessons. The first and probably most important lesson that we learned from our father being spoken about on the blogs or in the newspapers or wherever it may have been, or people speaking behind his back or in front of his face in disrespectful ways, um, probably the most important lesson that we learned is that the story is almost never the way it's being reported. You know, we lived the stories and we saw actually what was going on and then we also used to watch how it was reported, and we were shocked. How could it be that there's such a distortion? How could it be that people are willing to be so dishonest? And probably the most important lesson I learned from all of that was when you see something in the news, when you see something being reported, don't be so quick to assume that the story is really as it's being uh, documented. It's really often very, very different, and the nuances or the circumstances or the particulars of the story – are often very, very different than what we may be reading, which is a, a very important lesson. My father also uh, always, always told us as children, he said that whenever I'm attacked in the newspaper, and he said uh, it happens every so often, he told us, my revenge is that I'm not going to read it. And my father always says, I'm going to show them. They want me to read it. They want me to get upset. I'm just not going to read it. And I can tell you, that my father literally never read them. He really didn't read it. When people, at least when I was growing up, when people used to attack him, and sometimes there were very vicious attacks against him, my father just never paid attention to it, never read it. Sometimes I would be so frustrated, and I would show something to him, and he'd say, like, why are you reading this stuff? Just ignore it. You know, it's not, it's not worth your time. You have better things to be doing with your time. And I also remember very vividly that, even when all this was going on in the background and so many people were talking about 
my father, and I remember at times there were lawyers who would call me that they wanted to speak to me about a statement, what can Rav Shechter say, how can he respond, and with all that pressure going on in the background, my father was literally just sitting and learning as if nothing happened. It wasn't Mavatal him from his learning at all, and he wouldn't understand why we were responding to emails, why we were responding to phone calls, why statements needed to be made sometimes. You know, sometimes obviously they do need to be made, but oftentimes he said, you know, don't give in to this, don't let it destroy your day, just keep going and don't allow yourself to be uh, busy with the with often just the noise that comes with being a public figure. And that was a, a very a very powerful lesson. I, I, I do know that there are many who are not so respectful to my father as they should be. And, you know, I, I remember just recently that my father was asked to call a certain Kavir on behalf of a certain yeshiva. And my father, being the tremendous Balmidos and Balchesa that he is, said absolutely he'd be happy to call, but he told me that he thinks it would be a better sell if he went to visit the yeshiva, because this way he can tell the Gvir on the phone something about the yeshiva, and he can tell them personally that he went to see it and that he saw beautiful things there. So my father called and asked that he wanted to arrange uh, a meeting in that yeshiva, and I, uh, I remember that they responded to him that, you know, Rav Shecht is not a hashkafa, we don't, really wanna, we don't really want him coming, and it's not really the kind of person that we want our Talmidim meeting. And I was so hurt, I was so upset by that, I, you know, I couldn't believe it. And my father's response was, okay, so I'll call the Gvir without visiting the yeshiva. Like, what, why should they lose out just because they don't agree with me, just because they might not respect what I stand for? Like, they're still yeshiva, they're Marbite Torah, they're Chashev Talmide Chachamim, and they deserve to be supported. And that, to me, was a tremendous lesson, you know, just because people out there might not agree with you, people out there might not respect you, my father always taught us that we have to look beyond that, and we have to be able to look uh, at the bigger picture, at the overall perspective. It reminds me of when your father told us about uh, how Rafael Vechik used to write checks to all different kinds of yeshivas, and uh, uh, one of the collectors for was in Turikarta or a Satmi yeshiva or something would go around showing the check that he got from Rafael Vechik. So I guess that, that was a, a lesson that he learned from, from his rabbi. That should be giving to everybody. Yeah. No. Did, did um. No, you, you you chose to go into the family business. Um, some of your siblings did. Some of your siblings uh, didn't. Uh, but being like I can imagine, like being a doctor when your father is a uh, is a world renowned surgeon or something like that. Um, it, it might have its pluses and its minuses. Uh, are there any are there anything that you found that that being a a rav a marbitz Torah in your own right that uh, that that is particularly or particularly helpful because of your upbringing or particularly hurtful because of your upbringing? I'm not talking about like the general sense, which I don't think you were the beneficiary of uh, that you have in a lot of the places where it's just like a Yerusha, where the rabbanus goes be Yerusha because. Um, I, I don't think that's uh, that, that that's happened with you, but just uh, from your experiences, has has it been helpful or hurtful? Do people have different expectations of you because of that? Uh, very interesting question. You know, my my parents when we grew up, my parents never ever allowed us to use our last name for anything, and I remember very vividly that at some point in my years in Beis Medrash, I wanted to switch from one yeshiva to another. And it was in the middle of the year, and they wouldn't even give me an opportunity to come for an interview for a faher. And then I found out later on that my father was actually the Rebbe of the Rosh Hashiva of that yeshiva. So I said, Daddy, you know, maybe you can call on my behalf and let him know that it's your son. And my father got very upset, and he said, why would I do that? If you belong in that yeshiva and you deserve to get in, then you'll get in on your own. And if not, then you shouldn't be there. Why would I call them just because you're my son? And at times that really frustrated us as children that my father would never, ever use his name or his connections for us in any area at all of of life. And uh, as we get older, at least I appreciated very much that my father pushed us to make lives of our own, and my father really wanted us to be successful on our own. I, I do remember as a child that my father quoted us the Gemara Masechah Sanhedrin, 
where the Gemara tells us about a melech, that one of the jobs of a melech is that he has to write a Sefer Torah, and the Karabal Kol Yimei Chayav, he has to read from the Sefer Torah and seek counsel and guidance from the Sefer Torah all the days of his life, all the time. And my father mentioned to us that the Gemara says there, Afal Pi Shekos Sheinichelo of the Sefer Torah, even if one's father was the Melech and left him a Sefer Torah, still the Gemara says, Mitzvah Sheyicht of Mishalo, he has an obligation to commission a Sefer Torah to be written on his own when he takes upon the leadership, the leadership role in the community. And my father told us that this is an important lesson for every member of Klai Yisrael, but it was so relevant to my father's own children, and that is, even if you had a great father and he leaves you over a Sefer Torah, which our father does give us a tremendous Sefer Torah, my father encouraged us that mitzvah sheyicht of mishalo. We all have an obligation in life to really carve out our own relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to figure out what it is that we are going to do, how we're going to be successful, how we try to spend our time. And my father never, ever pushed us that we should go into the Rabbanus. He never was advocating for one thing or the other. He says all the time that he's proud of his children who have figured out you know, whatever professions they're in on their own, and I have sisters who are who have PhDs, and I have a brother who's in business, and another brother who's in Chinuch, and my father is so equally proud of all of them, because he used to stress this very often, mitzvah sheikh of Mishalo, that we should all really try to write our own Sefer Torah and try to figure out how to develop our own meaning and relationship in uh, in life itself. And, you know, you say about how it could be helpful that I have a father like this, well, first of all, probably one of the most important things in any position of Rabbanus anywhere in the world is that you need shimush tamid chachamim. You need to be able to uh, experience what it means to live a life as a rav and to experience the challenges and experience the kinds of responses and the attitudes that we need to have when dealing with tzarchet tzibur. And that's something that, uh, obviously, being the child of such parents is something that we all saw as children from a very young age and we're privileged to be a, a major part of. It obviously helps us deal with the things that come up in our lives and in our shuls and in our communities. Um, obviously, today, when I get complicated shilas, which, you know, in every community, there are always going to be complicated shilas, and almost always these kinds of questions are way beyond my expertise, which is limited, and way beyond my understanding. And it's a tremendous bracha to have my father and other great gedolim around who are able to address these questions and who have an understanding into the workings of our communities and an understanding in how to deal with the challenges that we all face. And I, uh, I'm often reminded of the Gemara Masech Shabbos where we're told, Tamas Chusavas, the Gemara there says that we no longer have Chusavas and Tosis has the Kasha. How could it be? Don't we know that every day in Shemona Esri we talk about Avram Yitzchak Yaakov? So how can you say that Chusavas has run out? So Tosis gives a, an answer, but I remember that there's a vote from the Rijaner where he says, Tamas Chusavas doesn't mean that it ran out, but rather that we are Matmiya, we are so overwhelmed, we are so amazed by the Chusavas that we have. When we think about the stories of our of our ancestors, of our fathers, and we consider how incredible their lives are and how much they've accomplished, that is a Dabur Tamua, that is something that is absolutely amazing. And uh, that's what I think about often when I when I take a step back and consider how blessed and lucky our family, our children are to be the children of such a great person that, you know, we are Matmiya, we are amazed that this person who is so shakua and sachit zibur, but so shakua and Talmud Torah, but at the same time so dedicated to other people and so dedicated to Klal Yisrael and does so many things with Shem Shamayim. It's just it's it's an amazing schusavos to uh, be privileged to have. We've spoken a lot about the positives, and and I'm sure there are very many. But you you must notice that there are other rabbis' children who seem to be more rebellious and seem to not want to stay on the path of their fathers or do anything but what their father does. Is that, do you think that's, that's real, first of all? Do you think that's, uh, you know, that that's true? And, and if so, like, what sorts of feelings would a child have that would lead him to those kinds of... I definitely struggled with it for many years, um, you know, trying to figure out how to create my own identity and how to be my own person. 
it's definitely not easy. And, you know, for many years you try to run away from it. I think that's natural for a child to try to run away from it and create themselves. I remember I went with a group of friends to Australia for a summer. We were on a seed program. And on the way down, we stopped in Hong Kong for Shabbos because we couldn't take a direct flight from Eretz Yisrael. So we went to Hong Kong for Shabbos, and I said to myself as we were there, I'm like, I'm in the farthest place in the world that I can possibly be from my parents. And it made me so excited. I was 19 years old, and I was just thrilled to be really far away and in a place where nobody would know me. So Friday night we go to shul, and the rub in Hong Kong is giving some kind of sheer. And he's looking around, and he's trying to be interactive, and he says, okay, who knows the answer to this question? He asked some kind of complicated question, and he's, you know, nobody raised their hand. We were all shy. And he says, okay, Schechter in the back, what do you say? And I was shocked. I said, what does that mean? And he says, I'm about to quote something from one of your father's svarim. How do you not know the answer? <laughs> and I remember on that occasion, I said to myself, you know, you can try to run away as much as you want, uh, but instead of doing that, why not be proud of everything that your father represents? It doesn't mean you need to be the same. It doesn't mean you have to make the same choices as your parents may. But why not bask in the glory? Why not enjoy the uh, the incredible privilege and blessing that it is? So, again, I certainly struggled with it for a long time. But over time, you develop a tremendous appreciation for what it is. Once you start to develop your own identity and, and meaning in life itself, I, I remember vividly, that there was an article that came out years ago from Rabbi Yoel Schoenfeld. He's a Rav in Queens, and he's also the son of a of a very prominent Rav, Rabbi Fabian Schoenfeld. And they once interviewed Rabbi Yoel Schoenfeld, and they asked him, you know, what is it like to always be living in your father's shadow? And Rabbi Yoel Schoenfeld responded, and he said, my perspective is not that I'm living in my father's shadow, but rather that I am forever basking in my father's light. And I, I thought that was a tremendous perspective. I thought that was a very positive perspective and a very true one. Once you think of it that way, you can either ask yourself, am I living perpetually in someone else's shadow? Or are the experiences of my life ones that are really being a reflection of the tremendous light that I've been privileged to uh, to be exposed to? And that's, you know, once you are able to shift that perspective, it makes makes things very different. I, uh, I remember when I was learning in Eretz Yisrael, my father once came to give some shiurim, and he he told me to meet him in Bayit Vagan. That's where he was staying. So I got on a bus, and uh, I had a little Gemara Psachim with me. That's what we were learning at the time. And I sit down on the bus. I open the Gemara to the Perak Arve Psachim, and somebody next to me with a big white straw hat and a long beard with khaki pants sits down next to me. And five minutes in, he says, Nu, bachur ma telomed. And I'm rolling my eyes like, what does this guy want from me? Why is he bothering me? Just leave me alone. And he, you know, he starts engaging in conversation. I said, I'm learning Masechet Psachim. So he says, what daf? And we get in a whole discussion. And he says, Me'efota. I said, New York. He said, where? I, I said to myself, he's not going to know Washington Heights. I said, Manhattan. So he says, where are Manhattan? I said, Washington Heights. He said, Washington Heights? Yeshiva University? I said, Yes. So he says, what's your name? I told him, Shai Shechter. He says, Ata ben Shalar Rav Shechter? I said, yes, I am the son of Rav Shechter. He says, Shalom Aleichem, Ani al ben Shalar Rav Shach. I'm the son of the Rosh Hashiva Rav Tach. And I thought the guy was making fun of me. I thought he was kidding. So then he got all offended, and he took out his two datsuhut to show me that his name is really Shach. And this is the famous son of Rav Shach, who uh, there are many stories told about him. But it was very interesting to sit with him and to have this discussion. And actually, one of the things we spoke about was, what was it like being the son of Rav Shach? And how did you deal with creating your own identity? And this is a conversation I've had not just with him, but a conversation that I've had with children of very, very prominent and famous Hasidic Rebbe's as well. And, um, you know, children of very prominent people in other areas of life. And it's something that... I think we all struggle with, and it's uh, only human nature that we should struggle with it to mature and to develop our own identity and to figure out what it is that we can contribute. It seems like uh, pretty good advice for uh, for other rabbi sons or public figures, uh, children in general. Um, is there any other advice that you would give for someone like who's struggling with that with that issue, other than just try to carve your own path, focus on yourself? Is there anything else that they could do like um i don't know is it 
are, are there parents maybe that, that, that don't get it, that the kid needs to, to carve his own path and maybe contribute to the problem? Or just what, what, would, you, what would you tell someone? I, you, you mentioned you had all these conversations with people. Is there, is, is there anything else that you would tell people? You know, part of the challenge in, in our family was, and this is a very personal anecdote, um, part of the challenge was that I remember at some point I was supposed to write an essay for school, and uh, it was when I was in graduate school, and I was asked to write about Rabbi Sun syndrome, which is a real thing. And I did write about it, and then I showed it to my parents, and my father was looking at me like, what are you talking about? Like, why is it challenging to be my son? I don't even understand what the challenge could possibly be. <laughs> and to me, that was uh, an amazing testament to his humility that he didn't even see why it would be difficult to be his son, but it only compounded the difficulty when you have a father who doesn't even understand how challenging it actually could be to be uh, such a overwhelmingly uh, popular and highly celebrated figure it's um you know it's something you need to really work out on your own but something that i always i always um advise those who come to talk to me about this because there are many who have spoken about this issue and i always remind them of the following you know your parents aside from what they are to the world and aside from the popular personalities that they might be and all the celebrity status that they might have with them don't forget that they're also human beings, and they do the same mundane things that all parents do all over the world. And they drive carpools, and they drop you off at camp, and they, you know, give you spending money when you're going out to meet with friends. And they're, they're doing all the same things that all other regular parents are expected to do. And I think when you remind yourself of that, that when you strip away all of those layers and all the popularity and all the people outside of your own family and you just focus on the fact that they are also human beings and they're also regular people who are doing regular things and, you know, their kids are also fighting and their kids are also struggling. And I think it's something that should get chizuk because that's something that, you know, you just, you, you rein it all back in and you remind yourself that we're living a regular life and as highly celebrated as some aspects of life might be, there's a lot of very regular and mundane parts of life that we need to learn to appreciate as well. I, I tell people all the time, you know, I get emails every so often about a sheer that I may have posted online, and somebody will send me an email, you know, how much they enjoyed it, and somebody will maybe sometimes send a, uh, you know, call on the phone and say something very positive. And I always tell them, you know, it's very nice. I appreciate the phone call. I really don't need it for myself. I, you know, it's fine. But I always tell them, you know, I know my father is a God of Israel, but he's also my father, and he will appreciate somebody who appreciates his children. And I always encourage these people to send my parents an email. You know, you can, you can forget about me. I don't need the emails. I don't need the recognition. I don't need the phone call. But I always remind them that although it might be uncomfortable for you to send an email to a God of Israel, I think there's something very special to remind ourselves that in the end of the day, parents are parents. And, you know, with all the hoopla that goes around in the world and all the celebration that sometimes people have, in the end of the day, they are human beings and they are parents and they do share the experiences with many other parents and families. And that's something that we need to remind ourselves of. It's very beautiful that uh, that you, you consciously try to give your parents nachas. But it also um, brings up the a uh, very obvious point that in this entire conversation, I haven't asked about your mother's role in all of this. I imagine that the fact that you are who you are and that your siblings are who they are is not only because your father knew how to handle his own public persona and balance that with uh, regular family life, but probably is more attributable to your mother, I would, I would imagine. Is that is that fair to say? My my treading in uh, an area that I shouldn't uh, talk about over here, or is that uh, any thoughts about that? My mother is definitely a a personality in her own right. I what comes to mind when you talk about my mother is somebody once came over to my mother and asked her, "What is it like to be married to a God of Israel?" And my mother said, "I don't know. You better ask my husband." <laughs> so. You know, she is definitely a personality, and she kept things very lively in our home and continues to do so. But, you know, part of being the kind of public figure that my father is 
also invites a certain type of people to frequent the house. So obviously you're privileged to meet tremendous Tamir Chachamim and great Rosh Yeshiva, and sometimes you meet very famous politicians and very famous personalities. But outside of that, you also encounter many, many, um, I don't know how to say it respectfully, many people who are in tremendous need and sometimes who have tremendous difficulty and major problems and who might not be, you know, the best people that you want your children um, spending time with in your house. You know, your, my father always told us the story about how Rav Soloveitchik said when he went to Rav Chaim's house when he was a young child, he was scared to go in because there were so many Mishagayim who were roaming around the house that Rav, that Rav Soloveitchik felt like almost scared to go into Rav Chaim's house. And Rav Chaim was a legend for his chesed. They say that, they say that Rav Chaim... They say about Rav Chaim that he had a, they asked him, why do you have a front door if, if uh, anyone can come in any, anyway? He said, to be Yaitse Shita Sarambam in Mezuzah, that you need a door in order to be Chayv in Mezuzah, he's all right. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, that's legendary about Rav Chaim's um, kindness, but the truth is, for a family, it's very, very taxing and it's very difficult. And you need somebody to make sure that there's a balance there. On the one hand, you know, you might have people coming in and they do have needs, but at the same time, you need to sometimes know how to close the door and you need to know how to sometimes uh, make sure that people do not enter the house. I, I recently told my father that I saw a drusha of the Sri Daesh in his Sefer Lifrakim, where uh, Weinberg in the Sri Daesh writes that this is what it means when Rashi says on Chumash that Sara Imenu was responsible for the Anan that was on top of the oil of Avram Avinu. So he says we always understand that to mean that there was such ruchnias from Sara Imenu that there was like a holy cloud that was on top of the tent. But the Sri Daesh suggests that maybe part of the job of a, of a prominent Jewish wife is that she serve as the Anan. Although Avram Avinu's tent was open and he allowed everybody in, but she had to be the barrier, and she had to sometimes say, you know, we're going to put a cloud over the tent, and we're going to monitor what comes in and what goes out. And there are many, many occasions that I remember when, you know, somebody came to collect money, and my father, you know, was so humble and so sweet and was sitting there talking to the person and giving them so much time. And my mother realized that there was something very, I don't know, phony about the person, but something very off and something that didn't match up with the story. And my mother would just you know, insert herself and, you know, ask the person to please, you know, move on to the next house and go somewhere else. She, you know, very openly told them that, you know, the story is not appropriate or the story uh, doesn't sound correct and something's dishonest about it or something doesn't match up. And it's important that people like, you know, people like Manhige Yisrael have somebody there who can always be the balance and who can always uh, make sure that certain influences come in the house and cer- certain influences you know, stay away from the home. But my mother on her own comes from a tremendous legacy of Torah leadership as well. Her father was a Rosh Hashiva in Torah Das for 40 years, and she's a granddaughter of some of the great Bali Musa from Kelim. So my mother herself, you know, comes with her own persona and with her own Misora, and that was always something that we also admired. My mother told us stories all the time about her parents and her grandparents and all the stories about her mother when her mother used to um, used to welcome Rabbi Hanan when Rabbi Hanan was single. He used to come to their house every year in Chodesh Elo, and how Rav Hutner used to come, and all the Gedolim who we know to be great Gedolim, when she was growing up, those were the people that she knew. And that was always very special, that my mother brought that experience to our family, was something that also gave us an appreciation of a world that we were so far into, a world that you know we, growing up as Americans, were you know, had really very limited understanding of what exactly that kind of world means and what exactly that kind of life uh, is really about. That was always a very special contribution that my mother brought to our family's uh, history as well. You spoke a lot about um, uh, the, 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 the dealing with being in the public eye. But the, the, uh, you must have had some very unusual experiences for uh, a child to have. You must have seen, like you mentioned before, great people, great Talmidei Chachamim, great political personalities. Uh, is there, and, and probably a lot of times you see things that the world doesn't see, certain relationships probably that the world that the world doesn't see. I know this 
from our own private conversations where you've shared some things with me, but are there any interesting stories? And this will be the last question, then we'll let you go. I know you're very busy, but are there any interesting stories of your father's interactions with other Gadol Torah or, or prominent personalities that you think would be uh, interesting for the audience to hear or uh, instructive in some way? My father, as I said, is such a humble person. So often when he's in the presence of another Gadol Yisro, He's very quiet, and he really doesn't want to show what he's all about, and he really um, carefully measures his words when he's in their presence. But one thing, you know, my father obviously told us many stories about his interactions with Reb Moshe over the years. Reb Moshe was actually my parents' shatchan, and my father was in absolute awe of Reb Moshe Feinstein, as, as many of the generation were and continue to be. Um, my mother told me that, after my father knew Rav Soloveitchik for probably 25 or 30 years already, and he was in the shir, and he was a Talmud, and he spoke to him, my mother said she remembers that they had an opportunity to be together in the car. I think she said they were going to a wedding together or something, and Rav Soloveitchik was sitting in the front seat, and somebody was driving, and my parents were in the back. And my mother said she remembers that my father was sitting there literally shaking in the back seat with his, with his hands between his knees, that he couldn't open his mouth, he couldn't bring himself to have a conversation, a casual conversation with Rev Soloveitchik. Even though he knew him for so many years and he was known to be a, a very close Talmud of his, my father's uh, tremendous respect that he has for other Talmud Chachamim is something that is always incredibly inspiring. I remember somebody was writing a biography about the Lubavitcher Rebbe and they called our house one evening because they wanted to include a chapter about the relationship between the Lubavitcher Rebbe and Rev Soloveitchik. They knew each other from Berlin, and then I think they continued on the relationship uh, in some way. So they wanted to know, you know, what Rev Soloveitchik felt about his special relationship with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So they called my parents home one night, and they asked my father when they'd be able to interview him, when they'd be able to come over and speak with him about it. And my father asked them, did you speak to this Talmud? Did you speak to that one? And they said yes. So my father said, why are you calling me? Why do you think that I would have more to share than they did? And they responded, what do you mean? Like, you were a Talmud of his for so long. You must have had conversations with him along the way about this. And my father, I remember vividly, my father answered, I don't remember having a casual conversation with Rev Soloveitchik. He said, like, I lived in awe of him, and he was my Rebbe, and I understood what he, what he represented and all that he was about, and I don't remember having casual conversations with him. And that was so telling to me that you can have such a long-standing relationship with someone and yet your humility doesn't allow you to ever cross the, the boundary of the kavod and the dignity that this Talmud Chacham deserves and your own personal growing into become a personality on your own. That, that is something that's amazing. But maybe one final story that I'll, I'll share with you was I remember when I was in Rabash Ariely Shir in the Miri Shiva, so my father was coming to Eretz Yisrael for something, and I thought it would be the right thing that my father should meet Rabash Ariely and thank him for, you know, for the, his Habatzas Torah, and, you know, just, just out of Hakar Satov, I thought it was the right thing. So I went to Rabash Ariely and I said, you know, I'd like to bring my father over on, on Shabbos. Is that okay? So he said, oh, you know, I, I would be very uncomfortable if Reb Shechter went out of his way to come to me. How about tell me where you're going to be, and I'll come visit him. So Rav Asher is also legendary for his humility, and I remember that uh, I told him, you know, my father's giving a shear here, he's giving a shear there, he's going to be running around. How about, you know, we'll just come to your house. So he reluctantly agreed, and I hope to never forget what happened when we actually came to Rav Asher house. So we got there, and there was a, a very small conversation between Rav Ariely and my brother-in-law, who was also in the shir and a very close Talmud of his. So they got in a small conversation, and then that finished up. Then I felt so awkward that it was just silence in the room. So I started to ask Rav Ariely something about the shir from the week before. It was about Rav and Chazaka. We were learning Baba Basra. So I thought it's a major Indian, it's a major sugya. So my father will have something to say. He'll contribute to the conversation. And Rosh Ariely gave some clarification to whatever it was that he said in the shir. And then, you know, that was it. My father didn't say anything. And uh, my father stood up, 
and he thanked Rav Ariely very much for his hashba and for all of his arbatzis Torah. And then uh, we left. You know, he he wished him a good Shabbos, and we left. Now, remember when we walked into the hallway, my father started to cry, and he said, "You don't understand the schus of how lucky you are to learn by such a tremendous anav." And uh, you know, I, I obviously didn't fully appreciate what it meant, and I, I still don't fully appreciate the tremendous schus, but that was my father's perspective. Sunday morning, Rav Asher came over to me in yeshiva, and he says, you know, thank you so much for bringing your father over, but he said, I wasn't aware that there were still such balimidos who existed in the world today. And Rav Asher said, I just want to thank you for bringing your father to meet me. It was the first time that we met each other, and he said, the midos are so obvious that uh, I was just overwhelmed that we were able to sit together. Now, this experience for me was amazing because I said to myself, I was sitting there, and there was no, basically no exchange of words and learning, but there was a conversation that they had in their own minds, and it was, a, it was an amazing exchange just in silence of sitting in each other's presence, neither one of them wanting to assert themselves, neither one of them wanting to uh, show what great Tamir Chacham they were, and both just sitting with tremendous humility and appreciating each other's company. And to me, it was such a powerful lesson that I, I firmly believe I was the only uh, uncomfortable person in the room. I was the only one who was feeling awkward about the fact that there was nothing being spoken about. And the two of them were extremely comfortable in each other's presence, even though there was a very, very minimal exchange of words between uh, these great personalities. Wow, that's a, that's a beautiful story. That's a great way to conclude. And um, I just want to thank you again very much. I think this was fascinating and uh, uh, very, very um, interesting for me to hear and I'm sure for many others. So thank you again for your time and for being so giving of, uh, of your experiences with us. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. We're now joined by Rav Baruch Oberlander, who is an Av Bezin of Budapest, Hungary, and a Chabad Shliach in Budapest, a very serious Talmud Chacham. And I just want to thank Rav Oberlander for taking from his time to talk with us. Welcome, Rav Oberlander. Hi. So I just want to uh, ask a couple of uh, questions, particularly, you know, this whole show that we're doing is, a, is about um, the particular challenges that are faced by uh, children and families of Rabbanim and of people that are public figures. And I thought that from a Chabad Shliach perspective, there are very, very different kinds of challenges. And uh, maybe you'd be able to, uh, to help us shed light on some of the halachic aspects of it. So, so first, let me maybe just to, to start with um, a discussion of the mitzvah of Kiruv in general, because if there's going to be some sacrifice, we have to understand what we're sacrificing for. So what exactly is the mitzvah of Kiruv? Is it an extension of Tolchacha, of Kal Yisrael HaRevim, Hashavas Aveda, like, like, like by saving a life, Avas Hashem, like the Rambam in the third, in, in third mitzvah, say for mitzvahs, that when you love something, you want to share the love with others. But what exactly is the Mechayev of, of Kiruv? And it's a, it, it's, it's a very a, a very good question, and I think we could talk a long time on the Chiyuv of Kiruv. But I think I, I, I think I should quote uh, the Tshuva of the Tzelem Erov in Shalos Tshuva's Migdalos Merkochim, Yeridei Chov Zayin. He, he asks the question over there if you, if uh, uh, if you should send a Majgiach to a farm to for have Chal of Yisrael, you know. So he writes over there. He says that no problem if he doesn't have minyan. So, you know, so ah, this is, this is, this is a, a, you know, he was a serious rov. He says, to be mezaka, a, 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 one yid, a lot of yidin, me'achila streifus, you potter mitfila. It is, uh, now, what is, I, I hear, what is, uh, now, I, I would just, you know, is it possible to argue that in a situation where a lot of people who are otherwise Shomer Torah mitzvahs 
are not going to have kosher food. And if you don't hold the Ramesha Satur of Chol Yisrael, then certainly not having Chol Yisrael, not having kosher food, is that maybe different than going out and finding people to be Makari, people who have not really crossed your path? Meaning, couldn't, couldn't it be like, uh, that my my chiv of kiruv is to deal with my coworkers, my neighbors. Meaning, do I have to go out of my way to find sick people so I could do bikur cholim? Do I have to go out of my way to find avelim to be menachem avelim? Or when I know of someone who's sick, so I have a mitzvah of bikur cholim. Okay, so the question the, you could put the same question: If somebody asks me that he needs a chol of yisrael, I'm going to go. If uh, do I have to make sure that all the stores should have chol of yisrael if somebody comes in? But but listen, this is just the the point. This is the point. What it, what is behind that is first of all, uh, behind that could be the mitzvah of uh, of toichocha. For example, I'm going to quote uh, it's the Rambam and the Shulchan Aruch brings it to Mekuf Namvav. Haroyas chaveru shechoto or sheholach b'derech loy toiva mitzvah olav lachziru elamutav. So this is this is one point. Although although it says over there. That um, if it's because nechasorin emunosam beisur sheos koshem oid limchez miyodam, then then it's not it's not a it's not a chiyuv. Interesting enough that the Rambam, when he talks about the tinek shenishba, uses the lotion roui lachziram bitshuva. Roui means it's a, like a tchila, it's a nice thing. He doesn't use the lotion chiyuv. Because could be taka, there's no the, not the mitzvah of uh, of teichocha, but um, it's also for example, possible that that it, you're not really in contr- in full control of it. So rohi lachzirum because you have to do your best, but uh, you don't know that you'll be able to be machzir. Yeah, but you can you, you don't use rohi rohi. You should you should do it. Rohi lachzirum ah means okay could be could be, but. Uh, the uh, Chassam Soifer in in Pituch in you know in the beginning of Shalosh Shuvas in Yeridea says we see we see from the mitzvah of Teichocha from the mitzvah of Matam Oisam as Benechem that the Torah doesn't want a person to be busy with himself a person has to be uh, a yid has to be busy teaching really the mitzvah of Lilmoit or Lalamit it's very hard to say Lalamit should only be when a bocher a mitzuyan comes that you should teach him. But if somebody is not a Metsuyan, uh, you know, uh, and he's far from a Metsuyan, uh, you shouldn't teach him. It's, uh, it's, very, it's, very, it's very hard. For example, um, you could use another point over here also, which is Daloche in, in, in Hilcha Shabbos in Manshin Vav, that Misha Sholcholo Yishetziu Bitoi, that if your daughter is taking away, somebody's daughter is taking away for, for Shmad, then you should be, uh, the person should be Machal Shabbos. And uh, even if it's a malacha, even if it's a malacha gemura, means a malacha doiraisa. Um, matter of fact, once I used this halacha here, a person had over here had the daughter for years, was in a certain cult, and once she called him up, that she, she there was some misunderstanding, got into a fight, and she said uh, she was somewhere in Europe. Says, you know, I don't have a, 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 a passport to come home. So I told the person, travel on Shabbos. Get the t- get the passport there as soon as possible because if she's going to go to the embassy and ask for a passport, you know things might uh, change. He didn't travel and, uh, and and she changed her mind. But you know if we're talking about uh, uh, a person has to has to uh, has a chiv of lelamid and and to the point that you know mechal shabbos for for saving somebody from shmat. I guess this is a pretty strong chiyuv of teaching. Or uh, right. Rav Shimon brings uh, that a person has a chiyuv of giving meiser from his time for teaching. Not only meiser from his money, but meiser from his Rav time. Rav Meiser writes this way in the Tshuva. That right. Rav Shimon yeah. yeah. in the Hakdam at Tashari Yosher talks about how HaKadosh Baruch Hu trusts you with... Uh, with with money and uh, you're supposed to do mitzvahs with it, but he also says meiser of your time. I didn't I didn't uh, even know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the meiser of your of your time. Um, if we're looking for other sources, um, for example, the the Tanya Nigeris Hakodesh Tazayan writes, Chayecho Koidmim is only when uh, we're on the same level. He needs something, I need something, so Chayecho Koidmim. But if the other for for the other person it's uh, Chaim Velamovis 
and for me it's just a step ahead then he he yeah he goes he goes before um uh, very good so I, i i just want to stop you there because you said so many very important things um the idea that you have to keep on teaching even if it's a person who's not the greatest talmud you know that anyone could be the rebbe for the tzaddikim but uh everybody needs uh, needs a rebbe and a prayer for 400 times but we pray yeah that's that's what it brought to mind we pray exactly um teaching 400 times but uh, you know you mentioned that the the khiv of talmud torah is 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 you know the way the rambam starts out uh hilchas talmud torah is that there's a he starts out with his potter but even when he talks about the khiv to be to to learn torah he talks about the khiv to be melame torah yeah, but but primarily the way it appears in the torah certainly is limatim as benechem and that's really where i want to sort of like now move this conversation a little bit because you you very correctly and um and very passionately pointed out that a person has to give up a lot of himself in order to teach torah to other yidden in order to be makari them how much does a person have to give up or is he even allowed to give up from his children's chinuch in order to be in a position to uh to to be mashpia on on other jews um is no question that uh, kirov shouldn't be what is it called a valving door that you know we make care of one and if on the other side we losing uh, another one I meaning you make care of uh, a kehilla and you losing your family your kids uh, surely that's not uh, uh, that's not the point because for this for surely you could say khayakh koidmim but the question is why do we uh, why do we think that by doing care of Uh, I'm giving away from my own kids. It's, I think I, so I, I think I, I, I think it's the opposite. Kids that grow up in such an environment are always in the tenure of giving, of teaching, and they feel always that they have an obligation of trying. You know, I see my little son is trying to help somebody in shul, finding the right page, whatever. And sometimes other kids that don't grow up in such an environment don't feel this. Uh, this achrayus uh, for somebody else yeah I, i very much hear that i was i was at a chabad kinnas shluchim a couple of years ago and uh I, the shaliach from one of the islands where there were terrible storms spoke and he told a maisa just an unbelievable maisa about how there was no electricity on the island and 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 everything was a khurban everything was destroyed the mitzvah was everything was destroyed and they, they, he had the opportunity to get off and uh to get it, you know they were rescuing people and uh he his shaila was should he go with the rest of his family to go off the island or should he stay behind to help the people that were still there and he said that his five or six year old son said tati if you go who's going to take care of our yidden and it was just such a like you can't you can't teach that to a child any other way than than experiencing it i i, I would think absolutely uh, I, there is a very interesting midrash in the end of parshas vayakel the major says it says ra ay kor hashem b'shem betzalel ben uri ben khur so the major says why is khur mentioned over here so the major says because he was moisa nefesh for 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 hashem that's why hashem makes sure whoever the moisa nefesh for him that he's going to have his his khar is going to have very good kids interesting i saw in the sefer base yakov he says and he says that uh, that uh, that's why we see all the big tzaddikim says moshere inu beinenu mi moidi zal mi varke the varke rab she tomid mosa nafsha avur toivas bnei israel neida bebiru she bnei ma yoitzim am yu doichsim va farchsim kemoshel so meaning uh, uh, by 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 teaching by teaching by example and by giving the kid the 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 the, the feeling of achrayus the, the kid is is, is gaining m- no question yeah I, but you know i i would certainly agree that if you know that 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 it seems obvious that if it were a shaila of losing your children uh has for shalom versus uh being the carry that that like you said khayakh kodman but i would imagine and again i'm not a khabachli i don't know but i would imagine that very often there are more subtle types of compromises like let me give a uh, lamashal you invite um people over to your house so your house is sort of an open door kind of uh kind of place and there are women that come and women don't always dress so sexy so your child is exposed 
to something like that, where otherwise he maybe wouldn't be exposed to it. Is he going to go off the derech because of it? Probably not. But, you know, but there, the, is, is it costing something when, you know, and, and this is not just Chabad, there's any Kiruv, that when you're involved with people who aren't living a religious lifestyle, there's, there's just going to be a certain exposure that the children have that they otherwise wouldn't have. How, how does one balance you know, the, the, the positives versus those kinds of, of more subtle uh, exposures? The kids are always exposed to a certain extent. Even if they live in a closed ghetto, but they go to a doctor's office, uh, they're exposed. If they go, you know, I don't think, uh, especially especially if you try to teach the people who come to your house that they should dress. <laughs> when they come to right. their own house, they should dress. Again, the, the message is the, the other way around. Uh, I don't see, uh, see, sometimes when it comes to Kiruv, people uh, suddenly become more um, sensitive than by, by taking uh, the kids to a trip to uh, great adventures where they're exposed in the middle of the summer. And nobody has second yeah. thoughts about taking the kids to great adventures in Chalamoy or in summer camp. So uh, I wouldn't say nobody. There are there are people that do have uh, that, that, that that would refrain from such things. But yeah, in okay, Afinami, your point is well taken. Yeah, it could be some people, but you know, I don't see people. Uh, I'm not saying uh, uh, try to to. Uh, I know not to try. People are able to 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 not to expose the kids to a certain point. Um, so, uh, uh, what, but other way, but other way, when you see, you hear the the your father teaching tzniyus, your mother teaching tzniyus, then uh, you also have said the Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, you know, very often the Chabad house could be operating in a community that can't get a daily minion, and sometimes they can't get a Shabbos minion. Um, you know, I, I know you mentioned before that with Chol of Yisrael. Let the mashkiach, you know, miss a minion. Let the mashkiach miss davening because he's also the mitzvah. I think you said from the Tzelim you know, because he's also the mitzvah. But can you make that sacrifice of of of, of for for your whole family that they're going to lose tefila b'tibor? They're going to lose the ability to uh, to daven with a minion. Um, uh, uh, you know, shal shal uh, when we're talking about, let's say, a hundred years ago, when every city and uh, town had a rov, for example, did they all have minion? For example, you know, the the the, the, the popper of the Vayaged Yaakov, uh, his first rabbonus was in Likav. And I spoke I spoke with somebody. He told me in Likav there was minion only on Shabbos because the the there weren't enough people. Everybody was uh, tarred. And it was only minion only on Shabbos. And I, I can tell you many more stories of big rabbonim that started their rabbonis in in small towns where there was no minion uh, during the week. So, uh, so you know, there's the only way of building a minion that you're there. I know many places where where you know you go and there's no minion. In five years from now, there's a nice minion. In 20 years from now, there's two minionim because whatever. You know, and and then you have uh, from Eden, whatever. You have to start somewhere, uh, and that's yeah. why all these rabbanim, all these rabbanim. When you see the list that milafonim, avid, bekila is one, two, three, four. You also, also always have to know that the first one or two were so small that a lot of times didn't have any minion. And you know, this is talk right. about the being zaka, zaka am yisrael. Right. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, uh, from a Talmud Torah perspective, um, is you know when you, when you're moving to a place that doesn't have the kinds of yeshivas that normally you would send your children to, or that maybe you were even zocha to go to when you were when you were a child, um, you know, is that is that the, uh, what does a parent do? Does he just have to make sure that he spends hours a day learning with his with his own kid, like the, the Torah says, so, you know, like the Torah says a person's supposed to do? Or like how, how does uh, how does one deal with uh, that kind of issue? Um, it's, 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 Gamla. it's always been it's always been taken care of by somebody else from the days of Yeshua ben Gamla, you know, with a father supplementing. But uh, yeah, practically, yeah. how does that work? This, this is probably this is probably used to be probably the biggest uh, the biggest uh, problem that Chabad Rabbanim and Shluchim had to face 
when they went to different faraway uh, places. The last few years, uh, they developed what's called an online school. And uh, my son was, uh, I think, the first year of that online school. He's married already with a kid. So we're talking about uh, 15 years ago at least. They started an online school with a, with a malama, then they learn Chumish, Gemara, and Alacha. So uh, it's uh, from the from the Mitzvah Talmud Torah uh, um, side, uh, the Baruch Hashem, the, the problem is solved. You could say that it's not so, uh, it's not always so uh, comfortable for the kids to have virtual friends and virtual malamad that talks to them, sees them. You know, the whole idea is online school. You yeah. see the malamad, the malamad sees you, and you see the other kids, and, you know, it's uh, interactive. They, you know, you ask questions, and they have tests, and, and by lunch they play, and they fight, and they... <laughs> uh, so yeah. this... Uh, in the beginning, the first year, my son was on. So he was on, like, in the afternoon hours, why? Because they had to take, you know, Siberia, Budapest, and Alaska should be together because it was the first year or the second year. So they tried, uh, but now they have already, you know, on regions. So you have uh, Europe, Hebrew, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's now it's comfortable, normal hours. They daven together and they learn together. And Baruch Hashem. Wow, and it's it's all in either English or Hebrew. That's that's how they work it out. Uh, that's what I know. I I, I, I didn't hear of uh, of Yiddish uh, uh, classes, but Hebrew or English uh, they have. You're saying or Hungarian and, or German or any other Chabad uh, No, so I'm talking Europe. Europe, Europe <laughs> has uh, mainly uh, Hebrew. Europe has Hebrew. You know, my kids don't use it anymore because now we have a, a Baruch Hashem, a nice big school. And we learn over there in Gemara and everything, you know, in a, in, in 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 the Chayde. But uh, in the beginning, we're talking about 15 years ago, we had already a, a, a school, but it wasn't up to that level yet. So uh, we used the online school. But here, anybody in Russia or anybody in you know in the end of Texas uh, uses this online school, and it's a okay, great program. Good malamdim and a great program. Uh, I guess socially it's not as a, the, the same, but uh, education is not the midst of Talmud Torah. Socially is not the midst of And and like you said, there's a trade-off. You're, you may be, he may be losing out on having uh, having friends that live nearby, but he's learning val- valuable lessons about taking care of Klal Yisrael. But let, let, let me ask you just more general, not not Chabad related, but um, you know, I, I, we spoke to Rabbi Shai Shechter, who's the son of uh, the guy of Herschel Shechter uh, from Yeshiva University. And mm-hmm. um, he spoke a little bit about what it was like growing up, seeing his father's name in the newspaper all the time and in the blogs. And, you know, especially Rabbi Herschel Shechter is sort of in between uh, different worlds. And uh, so he's subject to criticism from the left and criticism from the right. And it, it does is, is it a child? Is it usher for I'll start with this? Is it usher for a child to get involved in defending his father? Meaning, is that like what the Gemara says, not to not to get involved in your father's conversation? Is that a lack of moraav, or or can a child say, you know what, I I I know that my father is a tzaddik, and these people are misrepresenting him, and you know, write a letter to the newspaper or to make a comment or something? Is that a uh, is that an isser? And and then second, I guess, if it's not usher, is it at all valuable to do? What we always see in the, you know, in the Ilam HaAlacha, if we're talking about uh, the Tur and the Rosh or other, you know, the, 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 the children, the Einiklach, try to defend the parent, the father, the grandfather in the world of, uh, in the world of Alocha, in the world of uh, Torah. Uh, but to write letters to the newspaper, I practically don't, uh, don't feel uh, it's useful. I practically don't feel that my kids should get involved in in such things. You know, Anon Pala, the Yemom Anon, should be busy, you know, uh, spreading light and not fight with darkness, meaning uh, to the point that I, I don't feel myself that it, I should get involved defending myself most of the time. Most of the time, you know, the record uh, defends itself uh, better than anything else. Uh, yeah, know. I find that when 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 you respond to things, sometimes it just elevates the whole. It just escalates the whole uh, 
the whole, the whole issue. You ignore things and they go away eventually, and MS will ultimately stand. They say the worst That's, thing uh, you can do to a mistake is make is, is publish a correction. <laughs> <laughs> then everyone recognizes you. Yeah, I hear, I hear. That's uh, that certainly uh, certainly makes but a lot of sense. There's, there's, there's another very important uh, thing that I, I just saw recently. Uh, the, it's, it's brought down from the Pirkei de Rabeliezer that you know we always you know. Hashem said, you know, that Avram Avinu did so much for me, because you spread my name. The Pirkei de Rebeleze says that that Avram Avinu worked very hard, Avram Megayer Anoshim, Surah Megayer Anoshim, but they didn't, they didn't, uh, they didn't uh, stay. And still, Avram Avinu gets all the star because he worked so hard, uh, so hard for the Eivishter. Uh, I heard I heard in the name of uh, of uh, the Grizz uh, that he says, but at least at least you know the story that you know, somebody was teaching and the kids afterwards went away. He says while you were teaching they said Shema, so you know that's full of the Revach. So meaning yeah, we have to do that's why, Yeah, Rav, that, that's that's what you have. Uh, um, Ebenezer I think points out that Kalev, you know, is a hero of the story of the Miraglim, but uh, Kalev and Yeshua both, but Kalev, with all of his big speech, he ultimately failed. I mean, they didn't listen to him, but I think uh, they point out that, yeah, he, he ultimately failed. But in that moment, they paused. In that moment, they stopped complaining. So that, that moment is a win also, even if, if, in that, if, if it wasn't, wasn't long-lasting. Yeah, so, you know, so Avram Avinu himself was busy doing Kiruv, but uh, he didn't have uh, too much success, but he did it. So our job is to do, and, and Abe should help. We should have success. <laughs> but m- m- more to the, um, directly to the, to, I guess, the topic of this uh, of this show, on, on the Avram Avinu issue, yeah, the Ram says, I mean, carry tens of thousands of, uh, of people, and like Pirkei says, they says, they were all gone. But the one that wasn't gone was Kibi Yitzchak Yikari L'Chazera that uh, ultimately he had to make sure, and most important was that he was mechanic his, his own child properly. So I guess that's a, just an important hashkafa that, that, a, that a person should always have to make sure that uh, you know, the Rebun Islam gave you the ability to be mashpia on a lot of people, but one person for sure, or one set of people for sure that the Rebun Islam ex- ex- expects us to be mashpia on is uh, their own children, because uh, he gave us the responsibility of them. So... Uh, you know, that's, I guess, uh, more along the lines of uh, where we're trying to go with this show, that we have to make sure that our children are, uh, are taken care of. No question. There's also another point that I was thinking when, you know, we're talking about 100 and 150 years ago when, you know, they had the Hnosis Archim in the city and all these Archa Parche were invited to the house and it was the, the, the big Maila of Hnosis of, of Archim. These Archa Parche, there's only once in a while that you found the Shagas area <laughs> between the Archa Parche. <laughs> Usually, yeah. these Archa Parche were very prost uh, uh, people, and uh, and they also brought into the house sometimes, uh, you know, Nivul Peh and, you know, different Hanhaga that wasn't the best. But, you know, we're talking about Hanasis Archim, these were the people that, you know, the Archa Parche are very, uh, very simple, very simple people. And this is Achnas's origin. I was friends with a Yid uh, who passed away already, or Shlema Tversky, in Lawrence. And he told me that his father was a Hasidish Rebbe, Kamuvan, his name is Tversky. He said uh, his father was, uh, was a Hasidish Rebbe. And he said one time at his Simchas uh, Tesa Shoeva, uh, he had a tish in his sukkah, this, there was one fellow that came that was mamish, uh, so inappropriate. He was inappropriately dressed. He was talking inappropriately. He smelled. He was, uh, and the Rebbe sat him right next to him the whole time. And uh, someone said to the Rebbe afterwards, how could you put such a person next to you? Why did you, uh, well, you know, let him sit in the back? And he said, because I'm going to go to the Yolam HaMes, may have asked him, and I'm going to ask for a seat next to Moshe and Aaron, next to David and Shlomo, next to, and they're going to next to Abayi and Rava, and uh, they're going to tell me, we don't belong here. And I'm going to say, when I was down there, anyone could sit next to me. So <laughs> my scar should be that I should be able, even though my neshama smells a little bit, it should be able to sit next to, uh, okay. next to the Gedol So this is, uh, this, is, this, this is Kirov. This is Kirov, especially that a lot of these people are later on not, not going to smell anymore. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, uh, Rabbi Oberlander, I, I appreciate so much you took your time on an Arab Shabbos especially. Uh, I so thoroughly enjoyed hearing uh, your perspective, and uh, you seem to be so malay v'gadosh with Torah. Uh, thank you very, very much for joining us today, and have a wonderful day. Pleasure. Dave, should help me be able to do a little night, a lot of little night, and a lot of little night. Amen, amen. When we were thinking about who we should interview about the topic of rabbis' kids and the risk factors and their emotional development and the emotional development of children, of public figures, the very first person that came to mind was obviously Dr. Pelkovic. He's both a psychologist to the entire film community on all ends of the spectrum, revere and uh, and head on, as well as the son of a great rabbi, the father of Ralph Palkowitz, and additionally, this isn't only about the children of rabbis, but about the children of very busy public personalities, and Dr. Palkowitz himself is one of the busiest and most well-known people in the Orthodox community, so he's really coming at this from three different angles, and uh, knowing his children and what an outstanding job he did raising them, it's, uh, particularly somewhat, it, it's particularly meaningful to have the opportunity to talk to him. So uh, welcome, Dr. Palkovitz, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay, so let's get right into it. You know, there's a, a lot of discussion. I remember as a growing up, there were, I had three boys in my class whose fathers were rabbis, and, and even as kids, we used to always talk about rabbi son syndrome. And I, I, I didn't know exactly what it meant, but the sense that I got was that there was a perception, at least, that rabbi's kids can sometimes be rebellious than, uh, than, than other children. Um, so I just want to know, first of all, is that true? Are there, even among other religions, that, that children of clergy members or very public people or very busy people tend to... Uh, tend to be more rebellious or more problematic at certain states? Yeah, I, I think that like, like everything else in psychology, I think I've been in Britain as a is, is, is the answer is it depends. It very much depends. I mean, there's, um, there's kind of a part of the sastra, like a, a very interesting duality and a little, and a little um, empirical research done on this. On the one hand, um, we all know, we've seen it with our own eyes, that there's a certain seems to be um, certain tendency on the part of uh, boys in, in particular uh, to uh, to rebel, and it's certainly more salient because everybody will say, oh, "It's the rabbi's kid. We expect more more of you." So we've seen it. We've seen it, and I think that perception is true in certain cases. But there are also many many kids who really um, do fine with it. You know, maybe we can talk a little bit about. It. What some of the research has shown is associated with resilience of these kids, and what's associated with with risk. But um, certainly, by no means does being a rabbi's son or daughter guarantee that there are going to be problems. Uh, my favorite um, quotation from uh, Dr. Saul Levitz's uh, study on this is a psychologist who was a rub and has been living there as a child for the last number of years. And, has, has has done the only real empirical research on this that I'm familiar with, is that it's true that almost every rabbi's son and daughter complained about being in that position and unfair expectations, but it's also true, he said, that virtually everybody he studied, and he studied 40 adult children of rabbis, everybody he interviewed was upset when their fathers retired. Wow. That's, that's so interesting. I, I You know, I, I see with my own children, um, you know, uh, rabbi of a smaller community, um, but uh, my sons I, each each react differently to it and each handle it differently. But at least one of them were embarrassed if their friends knew that their father was a rabbi. Um, in in camp, where we, in the summer, one of my sons, when he was younger, uh, pretended I was his uncle, actually, um, and and my daughter is like so proud all she wants to do is shout from the rooftops that my father's the rabbi and she's you know to tell everybody who will listen and I wonder if that's if that's typical do sons and daughters react differently you know growing up we always heard rabbi son syndrome is it is it, are, are there differences between the way boys and girls handle this yeah I, I I think so again I'm not I'm not aware that there's been research on enough numbers to really answer it 
I think that in some ways um, it could be particularly stressful in rabbi sons. You know, boys may be somewhat more likely to to be challenging or to act out, but also, you know, the, the rabbi sons are are exposed so much more. They're in shul every every day, sometimes, you know, often often twice a day. Um, you know, they're they're also um, there, there seems to be um, somehow people feel very comfortable. Uh, men feel maybe more comfortable than women going to rabbi sons before their father gives a drasha to say, "Hey, make sure your father doesn't speak too long today," or or complaining about. <laughs> I've had that a few days. times. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and so I, I think that it's, it's just a, like a dose response relationship. They're 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 exposed a lot more, and I think that um, at least from from what I could see, um, I, I'm not minimizing because on daughters there's there's, there's uh, equal kinds of pressures, but not quite that constant drip of of daily exposure. Now, would, would it depend on on what kind of I imagine it would, and what kind of rabbi we're talking about? There's got to be a difference between a Hasidic rabbi where it's understood that his his son is supposed to be his Nimali Makom versus a rabbi of a modern Orthodox shul um, or a Litvish Rosh Hashiva. Um, I, I, I guess, like you said, there's not no research on it, but uh, what, are, what have your experiences uh, told you about those different segments of the community? Yeah, so I've again, I've seen it in in very in very uh, many different iterations. Um, where, for example, um, um, I've 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 worked with some families of uh, with a uh, Hasidic Shurabayan. And um, if if the person who's ultimately destined to take over, if it fits his temperament and it's something that he wants and he has a good close relationship with his father, then you just see a really beautiful kind of uh, kind kind of connection and teamwork between them, especially if the father is able to um, uh, be patiently groom his son. And model for him and allow him to find his own voice. When though there's the the, the um, a process that goes on where there's a lack of balance, let's say where where and it doesn't matter if it's a litvish rosh yeshiva or the love of a modern orthodox shul, when they allow the job to totally take over their life and they don't clear that time for their children. And they don't figure out a way to to um, make time to carve out kind of shul free uh, zone in their family life. That's 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 what I think there's there's a problem. But it's always an interaction of temperament and match and balance. Yeah, yeah. I, I was um, I always thought that the story with Yaakov and Esav, that the uh, you know the way the Chumash tells us how Yitzchak more better with Esav and, and Rivka with Yaakov, was that uh, at least part of it is that sometimes a parent um, connects better or is, places le- less pressure on the child that's not like them, uh, the child that's more like the spouse than than like them. Be totally off base over here, but you know, so I, I sometimes see in families that, and I'm sure you'll tell me if I'm off base, but I, I sometimes see in families that the, the the child who's just like the parent, the parent has such a hard time with that child. Like he he sees either all of his own failings, or he sees, uh, or or he just wants the kid to be more. I, I don't know what's what's behind that. Whereas if a person is in love with his spouse and there's a kid that's just like his spouse. It seems to, to to work a lot a lot better. First of all, is that before I question further, is that is that fair to say? Is that accurate? Is that totally off base? You, you mean that it's that it's a matter of uh, it's and, and, and so the difficulties with the kid who is marching to the beat of a different drum that feels alien to the father? Is, is that what you're you're suggesting? No, I was I was actually suggesting you, or you're the suggesting opposite. the opposite. Okay. You're suggesting the opposite. I hear that you're you're suggesting there's a greater the greater the similarity, 
the greater the closeness, and the greater the closeness, the greater the uh, the, the, the greater the emotional reactivity, because it's hard to hard hard to take a step back and to have that dispassionate uh, point of view. Um, I, I, I I've definitely I've definitely seen that. I've definitely seen that that there's uh, you know like anything else in life, you know the, the, the we have to find that, that that middle path, and when there's an intense closeness. Maybe because of how much is invested in the designated, uh, the designated um, heir or whatever. In general, any time I think that in a parent-child relationship we get invested in wanting our child to um, turn out a certain way or wanting wanting to save our children from making mistakes we made, we're just getting invested in there being a, a, a specific path for a kid rather than following the unique. The um, unique you know, the unique melody of that child. Um, it's a set. It's a setup for problems. So yeah, I, w- I would very much agree with that as as making a lot of sense. Yeah. Interesting. You, know, you, you mentioned carving out time for every child. I remember uh, years ago, twenty years ago, I I, I attended a uh, seminar given by Rabbi J J Schachter in Boston when he was living in Boston for young rabbanim. At the time, I was young, so uh, I, I qualified. It was, uh, I guess, a little oh, less than yeah. 20 years ago. And, um, and he spoke about the importance of spending time with your children. And he, he quoted a Rambam about uh, Avram Avinu uh, went around from town to town getting people to believe in, in the one and only Rebona and, Shalom. And, 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 and he made tens of thousands of, of converts. He had tens of thousands of followers. But what happened to all those tens of thousands of followers? At the end of the day, that, that everything came through Yitzchak. He came through his own children. And that the one, the one area that you know that you're supposed to be doing as a rabbi, the, the, one, the, 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 the one set of people that you know the Rebona Shalom definitely wants you to be mashpia on are, are your own children. Everybody else, maybe yes, maybe no. But your own children... Uh, for sure. So, so given that, and, and, and the point you made about carving out time for your own children, this is not only for Rabban and uh, Hatzalim members who are running out at all hours of the night, people with busy jobs in general, um, where work time approaches on home time, what are some tips that you might give to make sure that you don't sort of fall into that trap and to make sure that you are spending the right amount of time with your children? Yeah, so I mean, I think that um, that that it's it's largely number one about clarity, um, you know, putting that front and center. But I think the most effective rav or the most effective um, uh, leader or the most effective person who's uh, you know osik um, they're gonna they're, they're gonna be much more effective if they model for others. And they have really front and center in their mind the fact that um, th- that th- th- they ultimately their 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 wives and children have to have to come first. And I think paradoxically that makes them into good role models, and I think it, it makes them into better leaders. Um, you know, there's uh, there, there's all kinds of interesting research on rebbitzins on rabbis' wives showing that they in fact. Um, their, their number one complaint is often about how sometimes the the demands of the rabbanus totally engulf their lives and leads to stress. And 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 to the extent that um, a rav and and the rabbinic family is able to create a shul free sphere uh, in their home, I think it can make it make an enormous difference. And have them view it as sort of like, okay, this is like a community kind of thing. I see sometimes in the Lubavitch community where it's viewed as a family business and where, you know, in, 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 in especially in different involved parts. In the whole family. Involved. And I think that, not that there aren't problems there also, but I often see this amazing kind of um, uh, upbringing for those kids because they literally um, – Many of them view it as 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 a partnership and as a team. I have this memory of growing up in um, in the White Shoal of um, us helping out. You know, 
um, and, and in a way that was fun. You know, so we would help back in the in the pre-email era where we would help stuff envelopes or we would help with mass mailings or we'd help set up uh, the show for, uh, you know, or, or, or set up for a shear. I mean, I remember my father would always, you know, have a list of sparring for me to get and I would sit near near him sometimes during a shear and put, um, you know, I was asked to get to, he, he made sure to, in some ways, actively involve all of us, as did my uh, my mother, Allah Shalom. And, and it, it, it just, it made it, I, I, I certainly had, um, you know, much lower level of resentment than I would have otherwise because of that. Wow. Um, what would be some of the, of the one right, that a child maybe needs more attention? You know, I, I find sometimes when, I'm sure you find this a lot, that when, when someone needs help, by the time they look for help and they look, it's uh they're so so far down the road. Like I find this with marriages a lot of times. That a couple will come to me and and and, and uh, ask for a recommendation for a therapist, and and very often by the time they do that, the marriage is, is pretty much over. You know, so like it would be unfortunate if a parent waited to see that his child was completely rebelling before reacting to it. What would be some of the uh, the early warning signs? Like how would you differentiate between kids being something that's maybe a, a troubling sign of, of where a child is headed. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, the, the number one thing I think you look for is any any change in, be, in behavior. If you have a kid who seems to have been doing well and and now there's a shift, and that could happen. It could be that a kid is, is really well adjusted, but then when he or she hits adolescence and they're more self-aware or maybe more sensitive, I, I, I know that... Um, um, I remember that um, when I was uh, either in camp or 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 in, or in school, that if a bunch of my friends were gathered around, and maybe um, sharing, uh, I don't know, tell, telling telling inappropriate jokes, let's say, or sharing inappropriate material, which happened even back then in the 50s, um, when I would come nearby, there'd immediately be a silence. You know, they say that, like they changed the subject, and I remember um, that at a certain point when I was in adolescence, where the number one need of every teenager is to fit in, it became it became more of a challenge back then. You know, because you want to be like everybody else. So, so the way that might show itself is it's surprising. Now, by the way, and it, it wasn't the end of the world. It was a minor thing. It, to me, it becomes something that needs attention. It, it, again, it either it leads to to a change, that, you know, that might show increased irritability, it might show some signs of uh, sadness, some signs of um, some signs maybe of more acting out behavior that that wasn't around there before, some more rebelliousness, and it may start relatively relatively um, uh, low level. You know, there's uh, there, there's uh, the story I forget who I heard it from, but I think it's an often repeated story about the um, about the rabbi's um, son who started um, to become very rebellious. And when he was sent to a psychologist to talk about it, he said, "I was hoping that just like my father sits down with all the troubled kids in the shul, I was hoping that maybe I could get an appointment with him also." You know, so it's it's but so the key is to be on the lookout. But usually, it's a change in behavior, or even if it's pre-existing behavior, at the point that it becomes um, persistent, pervasive, or in any way interferes with day-to-day functioning, that's when you have a dark red flag that really needs to be dealt with sooner rather than later. You mentioned something there that I find very, uh, very interesting, and that is that experience you had of feeling left out, feeling different from everybody else. On a certain level, um, that's going to happen with, with rabbis. I mean, how many rabbis do I know that their kid is the, the only kid in the community or in his school without a TV in his house? Um, you know, the Internet somewhat of an equalizer, maybe without a smartphone or without some... So there are certain things that that he, he's just going to be different. How should a parent try to make sure that he doesn't feel left out, that he doesn't 
feel different from from everybody else. There's some way I manage that. I assume you shouldn't just tell him to like you know just be like everybody else. He, he does hold a certain standard in, in uh, yeah. his life. Yeah, and, and that's that's a really common question. And where I really get that, I get that most from children of like principals, you know, or children of a, of a Jewish educators or administrators, you know, who are often living um, in in different parts of the country where they are held to a much tougher standard than all their friends are, and it really is hard. And you have to have seichel and knowing. Um, and, and knowing when to be flexible and when, and when not to be flexible. I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that it, it, it has to be done in a way that you empathize with the kid, you allow them to be upset, you, you figure out there might be a time, for example, I can think of a situation where when kids are only getting together through, through uh, texting and um, you know, maybe a time to have a kosher phone that always allows texting. You know, and, and, and I find that when parents have, um, are firm and understanding in terms of having their eye on the ball in terms of what their, their, their um, goal is, and at the same time know when to be flexible. It's like, you know, everything else, finding the balance between love and limits with this. Right. But the most important thing I think is you validate. You allow them to be upset. You allow them to be angry and, and um, don't feel that just because you're empathizing with their being upset, that validation is the same as agreeing with giving in on it. And it's an art, and it's going to be very different for each of the kids. What is it the Cutsworth said? There's nothing as unequal as the equal treatment of children. So it'll depend on the kid. It'll depend on their temperament. Right, right. Well, it's, it's, you know, someone that, once told me that he feels that parents make their mistakes on their oldest children, and then they sort of figure it out with the uh, with the younger children. I really don't find that to be the case at all. Yeah, yeah. Each child is so different, and you know, and you just have more pressures yeah. in life by the time the younger children are there. And I um, often I often see along those lines that it's that it's often the youngest child who's the greatest risk for serious behavioral problems. At least, and, you know, and there is some research on that. Just in general. Why is, so, that? So, Why is that? Well, I think because um, to a certain extent, um, by the time you get down to, to, to your youngest, parents might be much more relaxed, much more flexible, and they may find a hard time finding that balance. So they, they, they're, they're, they might be coasting, and they might be, there might be less, less uh, supervision. And, you know, you know, again, what works best is the middle ground. So any extreme on either end, you know, with older kids, the tendency is to be maybe a little bit too rigid. With younger kids, a little bit, a little bit too lax. And in either case, unless you find that middle path, it's not going to work. Right. Now, if if I can get personal to you, to your circumstance and uh, sure. your amazing father, um, did your father ever? You know, your grandfather was a rev also. But my father-in-law actually just showed me the Sefer written by the Shimon Shkaf that your grandfather gave to my father-in-law at his Dharma. And, and he told him uh, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, I think it was, right? That, yes, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he told my father-in-law that uh, I, I never thought I'd be able to give a Bar Mitzvah boy a say so to do Shimon, uh, who's actually going to be able to understand it. So uh, he, Yeah, he and my, uh, yeah. Say. Yeah. So did, yeah. Considering that it was generations in your family, did, did you ever feel pressure? Did your father ever apply any pressure? To yeah, yeah, and, and 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 it goes even past. I think my my um, great grandfather also was, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Slabotka, like real Litvish, uh, um long line of Rabbanim. Um, interestingly, um, and my father never. Um, never had the least bit of pressure, I think, on any of us to do anything other than find our way and find our path. Um, as a matter of fact, in a way, when I was, um, we were in, I was in Tarvadas um, and went through Chuan and Yerodea there, you know, with the, with the expectation that I'd get, um, that I'd get Smicha, he, he said, look, great, you can get Smith if you want to be a Shulrav. But he says, otherwise, you know, it's just, just you know, he, he actually 
didn't feel that it made sense to have smicha if I wasn't going to be using it for um, <clears throat> use it, using it professionally. Um, so uh, he he was very he was very good about letting I think each each of us, me and my siblings, kind of find find you know, whichever way our heart uh, drew us, um, and 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 it worked. I mean, it worked in the sense that. Um, I think we each we each found what what works for us, um, and he had and he believed in us. He had trust in us. So after after having learned the Torah Das for a number of years, when I decided that I wanted to go get my doctorate in um, in Philadelphia, which uh, very few of my friends would have been allowed to do that, to just pick up and leave New York and go off to. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania, which was a hotbed of all kinds of uh, not such great stuff going on back there then in the height of the Vietnam War protests and everything like that. So I remember both my parents totally, totally supported the idea of us going, you know, with the idea that if we didn't do our job by now, then forget it. And the fact that he, um, that he believed in us and helped us find our way, helped us find our, our own inner, you know, sort of, you know, our signature strengths were was something that um, the older I get, the more I appreciate it. You know, because um, that was his philosophy of life, and as well as my mother, um, my mother, uh, Allah Shalom. You know, um, so I think that, um, and and then late, <clears throat> later on, that's when we started. Um, I think because he preserved that kind of uh, that kind of relationship. That's when we started to um, actively collaborate on writing a couple of books together, and we were often um, joint scholars and residents in different parts of the uh, different parts of the the, the, um, the, the, the world. And it was uh, it was amazing. We became uh, we became cl- uh, you know much closer, I think, than we would have been otherwise because he preserved that that level of independence. It's, it's so amazing that, that the irony of it is that you overlapped tremendously in terms of what you do, serving Klal Yisrael, inspiring people, educating people, but because you did it in different ways, it made sense to bring you as joint scholars and residents. It made sense for you to collaborate on a book, whereas rabbis don't typically collaborate on a, on, on a book. It doesn't really add much if it's they're coming with the same skill set. Oh, yeah. And it's so inspiring that... Um, that, that specifically because he recognized your co-hosts, right, right, and, and my brother, able to complement uh, each other. Exactly, exactly. I, 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 he, um, and my bar mitzvah. I'll always remember the drasha he gave in my bar mitzvah, which happened to be the first bar mitzvah in the uh, new White Shell building back in 1964, okay. and. Um, I remember standing up there, you know, that awkward moment when the Rav is giving the drusha to the bar mitzvah boy and, you know, the kid is looking at him. He, his message was that his dream was to give the world um, a good listener. He said, if I, could, if I could give the world just one good listener, I'll be a very happy man. And um, I don't know how, how powerful, uh, how powerful uh, a bar mitzvah speech could be, but somehow I imagine that he was picking up on, you know, on wanting to fan the flames of whatever quality he saw in me that was able, hopefully, to, to do that. That's remarkable. But at the age of 13, he already saw that in you because, I mean, that's, that's what you do. <laughs> that's really unbelievable. Yeah. You know, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was just thinking that you know, as I was very lucky. We're all very lucky to uh, you know to have that. Great. So I think that that's a great way to end because I find that so inspiring. And I just want to thank you again for. I know how valuable your time is. I probably don't. I don't really understand fully just how busy <laughs> you are. But um, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to, to speak with me this morning. I think I think people will gain a tremendous. On this, both rabbis and non rabbis, I think everyone will gain a tremendous amount from it. So I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's like a good, a good therapy session. You're a great therapist. <laughs> okay, take care. Have a great day. Okay, thanks. Okay, right, bye. Let's go to the chosen winner of this week's riddle. Uh, this weekly riddle um, the problem of Abdurrah Shalamasim being to to the Victorian, Mr. Shokhanov says you're not allowed to be. 
or the uh, the Tzvima in the Sefer Tzavos Bracha says and differentiates between whether you're Doirish and ask a Bakasha from the Mace, or you ask the Mace to be Mavakish from a Kashborch. And therefore, like we say, Malachi Rachmi Meshosi Elion Falu Nop Mekail, so that's when we ask the Malachim to plead to a Kashborch, and that's, and that's the Seder. So that's the solution to that problem. And as far as that, the only Moshe, the question on the Shach, so there's a future roots in uh, the, the, uh, the, the, there's one terrorist that that uh, since we since we want to the Yoshua was upset that Elder made that were declaring that Moshe was Mace and Yeshua Machis and Oris, he wanted to declare that Moshe was the Adoin, and he said Adoin in Moshe to show not to disrespect a full care to show that he was the exclusive Adon and nobody else was was the Malik of Kol Israel. And we have a riot to this from Batsheva who says, uh, even though during the whole speech discussing with him, she calls him Adoni Amelech, but at the end, when she, he, he, he told her that Shlomo was going to be the king, uh, so he, she declared by that saying, that David is really the exclusive and an all-time Melech Yisrael. Call Phil Jai 